and the International Affairs Department from the Minister of Finance. I always like these long official names. <laughs> Ramunas uh, Vilpi Sauskas, Director of the Institute of International Relations and Political Science of Vilnius University. And we talk about economy. Uh, general picture, economy seems to be a very clear case where the EU unites the Nordic Baltic uh, Baltic region. The internal market for sure has contributed for trade. We have very uh, intense trade relations within the whole region, as it of course always is between the neighbours, but uh, clearly the common framework has contributed uh, to that. Just when you look to the latest Estonian statistics, then uh, Finland and Sweden are the main export partners. Latvia is also always among top five. Lithuania also. Uh, the same goes for the investments, but in particular Nordic has in a way entered into the Baltic region first, mainly through Estonia, but then also uh, through other, other Baltic countries and the investments between the Baltic countries are also becoming more and more active. Um, macroeconomic policy is very similar, approach to the budget is very similar, conservative. We have very common lines in the EU, but at the same time, of course, when you look into the more details, there are also more controversial issues. There is a Eurozone, where not all the countries are members of the, of the Eurozone. There is a emerging EU social agenda, where the views of the different countries are quite, uh, quite different, I would say, to the, what should be done in, the, in general and also in the EU level. When we look at the trade with the third countries, also there are some, uh, some different views and of course it was already quite a lot discussed in the, in the first panel also uh, on Brexit. And clearly the leaving of the UK has a quite strong impact also on how the Nordic and Baltic group as such uh, should be act in the, in the EU. And we will try to cover all these, all these issues during, the, during our, um, our discussion um, here. And I would like to start with Skalis, Bukowskis and, and Latvia. And could you elaborate a little bit on the Latvian view on the, on the general impact of, of economic integration to the region and maybe also the social agenda and, and also other topics that you find uh, worth to mention? Please. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, it's fine. Yes, yes. Yeah, then, uh, as, as, as we have only 10 minutes, I'm going to be, try to be very uh, concise and precise. <laughs> Um, Keith, you already started with the uh, explanation that, of course, the economic integration is one of the uh, aspects that has been more or less the, uh, the positive uh, thing for the, or, or the most visibly positive thing for the, uh, for the EU integration and one of the greatest profits from that. Um, I completely agree with that and the very fact that the European Union basically provided to all three Baltic states an environment to excel, to basically provide the um, safety for foreign investors, also the structure and predictability uh, of, 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 of the economy for the domestic businesses. Um, EU has been facilitating the Baltic state growth. This is, this is in no way uh, a secret and there is uh, there's, there's, there's visible, uh, visible developments in, in, in the numbers. And it's not only about the multi-annual financial framework, of course, in the country envelopes, and that has been a quite a an important element to also Latvian growth. We have been uh, doing the estimations that the, the GDP of Latvia would be normally growing at the pace of 2, 2.5% of, of, of uh, uh, but uh, with the addition of the MFF, it, it gets additional 1.5, 2% every year, uh, additional growth to that. Um, but it's not, th those are the visible things, but I, in my mind, the most important aspect of this EU integration, economic integration aspect is, is the very fact that uh, um, EU integration allowed us to secure the access to the international finances. And it's a paramount aspect for all small countries, especially the, the ones which we are here lo located somewhat 
marginally in periphery is to have the access to the finances and to the technology, and in this case, being part of the European Union, being part of the Nordic Baltic region is essential part uh, how to, how to uh, acquire this. So in this case, from the perspective of, let's start, I'm going to start quickly about the success aspects of the uh, European integration from the economic perspective, of course, the influx of investments. And in this case, of course, the Nordic Baltic uh, framework is essential because, uh, because those are the predominantly Swedish banks who have been facilitating uh, capital influx in, into the Baltic states and actually have been becoming the structural banks and an essential part of very many sectors to be actually developed, including in Latvian case, being that the um, university uh, study crediting, being that the real estate uh, uh, property sector, being that financing to the uh, big enterprises, uh, being that also financing to individual uh, entrepreneurs, that has been actually the capital which the domestic indigenous banks lacked, especially in the 90s, and uh, starting with the influx of the of the Swedish, also Finnish capital, that has been a, a tremendous uh, uh, progress from the point of view of the capitalization of the economy. So in this case, our catching up with the European Union average, in the Latvian case, well, we, when we joined the European Union, we had about 46% uh, of the average of the European Union GDP per capita. Now we are at the levels of 64. After Brexit, we're hoping to reach the level of 65, because, of course, the average level will <laughs> decrease. Um, uh, sorry for the cynical joke. Um, so in this case, another thing which is, has been essential is us becoming part of the global production processes, meaning that our companies are part of the uh, very many major uh, European enterprises, and they have been had access to, to the technology, to the know-how that, uh, that previously before the EU membership wasn't that easily available. Same time, of course, we have been donating labor force, as some of my colleagues have been always saying. We, are, we could be considered as a donor countries as well, because we are the ones who have been uh, losing, the, uh, losing the labor force uh, in the advantage of, 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 of Western European countries. But at the same time, of course, we should not forget the remittance aspect and the very fact that the money being sent back to the uh, Baltic states. In case of Latvia, the number is estimated about a half a billion euros every year uh, from all around the world. That is the, that is the number that uh, is, is, is being sent to the family members back home. Um, is it only the economic integration? And now I have to actually put a little bit of, 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 of tar in, 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 in the whole uh, honeypot, is that um, at the same time, especially in case of Latvia and Lithuanian case, that's, that's a little bit less uh, visible, but in case of Latvia, we, ha we are still facing, and that's one of the biggest problems, is that this fragmented economy. So according to economic integration theory, the idea was that basically companies will be merging, mergers and acquisitions happening in order to be able to compete with foreign uh, or, or bigger companies from other European Union member states. In case of Latvia, you don't see that happening on a, on a, on a quick scale. It's actually uh, very often the situation that the uh, tax, tax rebates and tax deductions actually allow companies to be more into being small, willing to be smaller than actually merging and becoming. And bad is the, uh, bad is the entrepreneur who doesn't want to be uh, a monopoly, but in Latvian case, apparently, there are very little number of those. Another thing which is very often uh, mentioned, although I do not fully agree with this, uh, uh, because I still think that the uh, EU funding, and meaning multi-annual financial framework and country envelopes, and, and also the agricultural subsidies have been su helping the economy to be capitalized, but there are very many voices who are saying that this uh, has dependence on EU co-financing is actually hurting the economy. So to a large extent, some of the companies capable of being uh, quite productive also on, on without without any uh, assistance there this decommercialization uh, has been has been happening in in, in the minds of, of, of some of the or way too many businesses um, marketing that's another thing which actually uh, again being part of the European Union well first of all the costs some companies cannot afford it uh, in some cases they don't understand why it's even necessary and marketing is actually one of the things which, which needs to be uh, very, very quickly uh, 
uh, increased and, 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 and promoted and adjusted in the Baltic states and the Baltic, uh, of, of the Baltic products as such. Um, just to finalize, because in order not to run around, uh, not to run above the uh, promised 10 minutes, uh, social agenda aspect, and that of course, as I said, the fragmentation aspect in the, in, in the economy, which is pushing the, also the, uh, the salaries down, is that uh, inequality has been the problem, especially in case of Latvia, but actually it's, a, it's, it's the problem in all three Baltic countries that inequality has been one of the biggest social problems. Uh, at the same time, of course, taking into account our uh, understanding that we cannot be increasing the wages and so social benefits just because we, first of all, uh, need to preserve our competitiveness, that's the logic which is still there. Uh, from the other point of view, uh, this, especially in case of Latvia, it's not only the very fact that this year is the first steps to progressive taxation uh, that uh, in, in, in the fiscal policy, is actually demonstrating not only the fact that this is being done before, well, in the, in the election year as a, so to speak, uh, government, I'm going to say this, government populist plans, uh, but, uh, in the, but it's also the very fact that it's a part of the national security. Whatever internal divisions, and especially if those are exacerbated by external uh, influences, of course, can, can become dangerous uh, dividing forces in the country, and so in this case, social inequality issue is, is one of the uh, topical issues that needs to be addressed, so to speak, in this case. Not the country should be rich, it's the people who should be, in this case, participating in, in the process and having the stake in all the, in all the process as, 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 as much as possible. Um, then, of course, the productivity issue, when we speak about the competitiveness uh, and, and, and not having the uh, not having the uh, higher social standards uh, and, 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 and following all the uh, hopes and expectations of the uh, uh, social rights pillar of the European Union. It's actually this productivity issue. We are always a bit of in a tricky position about the productivity and higher wages. Does increasing wages increase productivity or vice versa? It doesn't. And that's actually a bit of a a leap of hope into the uh, human human ethics uh, more than more than an economic uh, conundrum and uh, finally the uh, one of the biggest problems again going back to what I started with the accumulated capital the capitalization of the economy so uh, we have to keep in mind that um, one of the biggest challenges will be the uh, and it's very often mentioned, will be the pension system and the very fact that uh, large proportions of, of, of society have been uh, uh, literally evading paying taxes. And so in this case, they are there. We're talking about a couple of hundred thousand people who very soon can be on the pension system with receiving very little uh, pension payments just for the very simple reason that throughout the 90s and 2000s, they haven't been uh, sufficiently paying uh, paying into the taxes. So in this case, the very pension funds being low, of course, also is one of the aspects which prevents us uh, and a lack of the accumulated uh, capital in general, which prevents us uh, from being more socially proactive, so to speak, more 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 going into more social uh, redistribution than than we could. It's simply simple as. Simple as fact, we simply cannot afford it. That that would be the uh, that would be the uh, bottom line. I think I'm going to stop here with this negative note so that we can have a discussion. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I discussed with Christy also before that uh, she expects from us at the end the concrete ideas also what we could do uh, further as concrete steps. So it's good that you throw out some challenges also and negative issues so we can discuss. But I think in a way one of your main messages was that what the EU has, has done is to, in a way, to create this kind of welfare transfer mechanism or environment from the Nordic to, to Baltic countries. And some of these transfers are very direct, like through the MFF, where clearly the Nordic countries are all net payers and the Baltic countries are uh, net receivers. But then there are more this kind of indirect transfer mechanisms also, like the overall trade environment, internal market, and also also Eurozone and capital capital inflows. And uh, Lithuania now has been the latest 
joined of the of the eurozone from the Nordic Baltic region, and I would give the give the floor over to Ramunas to elaborate a little bit on the on the Lithuanian perspective on the same issues on the economic impact and how you see uh, Nordic Baltic this kind of economic integration today and challenges and benefits, please. Thank you, and thanks to the organizers for uh, having me here. Uh, just a few short introductory remarks, uh, starting with the Euro introduction, uh, uh, not just Lithuania, all three Baltic states interestingly joined the Eurozone as the last step of the exit from the Eurozone crisis. Uh, which is very different from most uh, other EU member states, in particular uh, Southern Eurozone members, where uh, crisis uh, initiated debates about potential Brexit uh, and, and breakup of the Eurozone. In some Central European countries like Poland, Hungary, we see uh, basically uh, abandoning uh, the debates about uh, the target date of Euro introduction in the Baltic states, I think, for two reasons. One is monetary policy that was uh, uh, set up in these countries. I mean, fixed exchange rates, currency board arrangements in Estonia and Lithuania. Uh, Euro introduction was seen as a logical next step uh, and, and there are some calculations uh, made in Lithuania how uh, much cheaper it would have been to borrow during the crisis in 2009, for example, if uh, investors were not counting theoretical possibility of devaluation of our national currency liters. Uh, so if there was euro by then, uh, th there are concrete numbers by how much cheaper it would have been to borrow for uh, the Lithuanian institutions. So uh, this is one interesting aspect which I think needs to, to uh, be underlined. Another reason, of course, is uh, have interdependence with the rest of the Eurozone and also not non-Eurozone EU member states. Uh, generally, European Union and, and uh, the common market as well as the uh, common currency, which was also presented by the European Commission in 1990 when uh, Jacques Delors' report came out. It was presented as the next step of integration, which is natural when we have uh, a functioning common market. Of course, there is no complete common market in the EU, and I think it will never be fully complete because of technological progress, because of, of uh, other reasons, well, domestic uh, companies that are still trying to get uh, protection from uh, competition from other EU member states. But still, by global standards, EU is a very densely integrated area. And I think from, from the point of view of an economist, EU is first of all an instrument of managing interdependencies, trade interdependencies, investment, movement of people and uh, single currency is part of this effort of managing interdependencies. I, I recently talked uh, with our central bank governor, uh, Vitas Vasilauskas, about how Lithuania is uh, defining its national interests within the Eurozone, being part of 19 uh, members of the Eurozone. His first point was, we are open uh, interdependent economy. And this basically defines our national preferences. Therefore, we should be aware what's happening in those markets which are important trading partners to us, to our companies. We should support monetary policy that uh, uh, advances growth in those markets, not only in Lithuania, but in, in Germany, in Latvia, well, Poland is also an important market for Lithuania, even though it's not in the Eurozone. But the point is, if those countries are growing, it's good for Lithuania. And I think this should, should be also underlined as an important point. Not just Baltic states, Nordic countries also, by global standards, very small open economies. And, and I think in Nordic countries, this uh, understanding among policymakers is uh, much stronger than in the Baltic states, maybe in Estonia it has been traditionally 
uh, more clearly perceived uh, since Estonia already in the early 90s uh, started uh, implementing very open trade policy. And I think it was uh, a decision that, that uh, allowed Estonia to, to become more dynamic economy compared to Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, but the point for such economies like Baltic states and Nordic countries is, first of all, we are very much affected by what's happening outside of us, both uh, in a positive sense and in a negative sense. Positively, we grow if our main partners are growing. In a negative sense, what we saw in 2008, 2009, if something bad happens, if there are uh, financial sector problems, if economies go down in, in, in the outside world, we are likely to experience the same. What it all means, it means we benefit from rules of managing interdependence. And I get back to my main point, EU is an instrument of managing interdependence, so Brexit uh, policies of Donald Trump, they are, I think, causing so much concern because they question instruments of managing interdependencies. And therefore, they pose the biggest risks for countries and economies like Baltic states and, and Nordic countries. And I think this threat perception is one of the new uniting factors that uh, I, I see is uh, encouraging uh, Baltic Nordic cooperation and also search for other partners in the EU, which was discussed in the first uh, session. Netherlands, uh, Ireland, Hanseatic League, uh, I think these, these formats are, to a large extent, a reaction to Brexit, which will weaken the single market, unfortunately. Uh, voices supporting further consolidation of the single market will become uh, more silent or weaker, unfortunately. That's, that's bad news for the Baltic states and also transatlantic tensions. In particular, zero-sum mentality of Donald Trump uh, when he looks into trade relations where he applies the same logic as companies competing among themselves. He sees countries competing among themselves, which is completely wrong uh, if we are familiar at least with Adam Smith, David Ricardo ideas. You cannot compare companies and countries uh, competing in the same way because comparative advantages provide benefits to all international trade participants, although these advantages are different. And I think the biggest challenge uh, to, to come to the social issues is how to show the benefits to population of this international competition, of being part of the single market, because, well, election of Donald Trump is to a large extent, uh, an outcome of the popular revolt against uh, what are seen as effects of globalization, stagnant incomes of middle class in the US. And uh, actually, I haven't seen any new recipes uh, how to deal with that, aside from the what probably could be called Danish success uh, or best practice model of flex security having an open economy, but at the same time trying to support uh, people's efforts to, to find jobs, to change qualifications, to retrain people by active labor market measures. Uh, and, and I think uh, this is the key issue also in the Baltic states in how to address uh, many social issues. Uh, two more final points. Uh, uh, if we talk about uh, public perception, actually Euro introduction uh, has, in a similar way like in other countries in Lithuania, brought a lot of public skepticism because most people associate price increases with Euro introduction. Uh, of course that was the case in most countries, but in Lithuania it's to extreme degree uh, because if we look in the Euro uh, barometer surveys, Issue number one for already one and a half, two years is inflation in Lithuania. Not emigration, not unemployment, uh, not, not refugees or, or things like that, but it's inflation. And uh, of course, this could be partly explained by convergence process. Uh, and many economists are uh, saying that. 
Lithuania actually has been the fastest converging country in the whole Central Eastern Europe. Uh, if we look into Eurostat data since uh, Lithuania joined the EU, the rate of convergence was, was the fastest uh, among, among this uh, region, but it creates resentment among, among population. And, and this is a difficult issue, I think, because you cannot regulate prices in a market economy, you cannot have magical recipes to such, to such uh, um, problem. You can just uh, try to create conditions for salaries to grow faster, which leads to productivity growth and things like that. But uh, this is a talk among e economists, policymakers are usually not interested in, in those uh, things. And another important issue is, of course, migration, emigration to, to other rich EU member states, and this is, again, an outcome of single market integration. Uh, what, from the point of view of economists, is a good thing, when countries with different levels of economic development are integrating, poorer countries grow faster, they attract investment from richer countries, richer countries attract labor from poorer countries, thereby reducing unemployment, uh, uh, getting uh, additional labor, and, and also growing faster as a re result of this. But when these differences are very significant, and I think that has been the case since enlargement of 2004, we get social and political tensions. We saw that with the services directive, debated in 2005-2006, demonstrations in France, in Belgium, in Germany, they were all uh, basically the result of concerns that cheaper labor will come to those countries. You know, Polish plumber, the image of Polish plumber created in, in France, it's a, it's a symbol of cheap labor coming to compete with, with local, uh, local force in, in, in richer countries. On the other hand, uh, we have a lot of debates about immigration in the Baltic states, and Lithuania and Latvia in particular stand out in this respect, though uh, I should also say in the last three months, for the first time, our net balance of migration became positive. More people are coming to Lithuania than leaving, which I hope is a new, new trend. And it doesn't seem to be tourism, uh, <laughs> not a summertime phenomenon. At least we will see that, that quite soon. So I'll stop here. Maybe Thank they you. Have I, I, in some tourists. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll no, be happy to elaborate on Brexit <laughs> and <laughs> transatlantic relations. Indeed, if indeed. We, talk we will, about we will uh, Thank you. Uh, come back to these issues uh, later. On. But indeed, of course, the interdependence of our economies is, is very high, as you rightly said. And, and these are all open economies. and. Um, this is, of course, one of the reasons. But you raised a very interesting, uh, interesting point um, <coughs> of the public image of the of the conversion. And uh, normally, it's other way around, like the like the Trump issue, and uh, that it's still more the countries who have already higher welfare. They are afraid of the the people are afraid of the losing the jobs, etc. But this is not. I would say, you can argue with me, but this has not been the main issue in Nordic Baltic. I uh, have not very much heard these discussions of the, in Sweden or, or Denmark or Finland that the Baltic, uh, Baltic people will come and, and take our jobs, uh, though there are quite many uh, Baltic uh, labor also in, in these countries. But indeed, there is another issue of the, that the people are flowing out and that the conversion might be perceived as too quick in terms of the, of the price increases and uh, general issues. And this is maybe also one of the issues we can, we can discuss later. But it seems indeed that the trend is a little bit changing also with the, when the welfare is increasing that you referred to the three last months, where in Lithuania it has been, migration has been positive. Uh, this uh, week there was just the news that now in Estonia it has been last three years where the migration, net migration has been positive, not in a very high rate, but still for a couple of thousand people are uh, coming in more than, uh, than leaving. So this might be also the case for other, other Baltic countries in the future. But uh, let's continue with the, with the conversion. 
and the Eurozone and Economic and Monetary Union, that we have a situation um, where at the beginning, when Eurozone was created, uh, and only Finland was part of the Eurozone from the Nordic Baltic region, and then other three Baltic countries have joined, but uh, other Nordics have not. And so not all the, all the countries of the Nordic Baltic are the members of the Eurozone, which creates, which has some impact. I, I don't say that it creates some issues or big problems, but it clearly has some impact. It has impact on the, on trade, on the, how the enterprises interact, but it has impact also on the, how the countries can act in the EU because still the quite many decision-making mechanisms are separate for the Eurozone uh, countries uh, compared, with the, um, compared with the not Eurozone countries. And Andres, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on the Eurozone, EMU, and maybe also on the EMU reform, which is a nice uh, hot issue currently in the, in the EU debates, please. Uh, thank you, I'm gladly to do so. But uh, first, uh, uh, a we'll, well, little bit on, on, on the issues already uh, covered uh, by Ramunas and Carlis. Uh, that, uh, uh, I mean, EU has been a really a kind of uniting factor also for, for, for the Nordic Baltics. Uh, and uh, I mean, basically, with one uh, clean sweep, you actually created one uh, uh, common uh, economic uh, space. And, and this, this has indeed uh, supported the uh, free movement of uh, goods, people, and, and also capital. Um, and uh, indeed, this has um, had a very kind of positive impact also on the convergence of the uh, Baltic states. I mean, when we started out in 1990s, uh, we were around 30-40% of the EU average now already closing in uh, to uh, 80% of EU average. So uh, uh, also this uh, mm, convergence um, also supports the integration also in, in Nordic politics. And, uh, and uh, there is also potential to kind of uh, maybe uh, to change also the current flows that uh, labor is going to the Nordics, but instead now they may be soon it uh, starts to come uh, come back, or or, or also uh, Nordic labor is coming here. So, um, and uh, we could already see that the investments that also the politics are making quite, quite a lot of investments in in the uh, Nordic countries. So, uh, in that sense, CU has been a very very um, kind of uh, positive. Um, Factor also in this uh, Nordic Baltic uh, integration, uh, and uh, and of course also the financial integration. Uh, I mean, the uh, financial sector is very much tied with the Nordic in the Nordic Baltic uh, region, and it also leads to the some of the issues related to the eurozone. Um, uh, if you take, uh, as yeah mentioned, that, that the Finland was the only one. Uh, uh, only member and then the three politics uh, uh, joined the Eurozone afterwards. Uh, of course, as already mentioned, that uh, the, um, the Baltics monetary arrangements were already such that there was not much difference to be uh, in the Eurozone or, or outside. Um, and also, if we consider Danish case, then you could um, you say that uh, I mean, Denmark is as, as close as you can get without actually being in to the Eurozone. So uh, it only leaves Sweden really outside. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also, if you look back to the Eurozone crisis years, then uh, uh, also Nordic countries were very, very much uh, involved and active in, uh, in uh, uh, providing uh, solutions or, or even financing, I mean, specifically the kind of Irish case where uh, Sweden and, to my knowledge, also Denmark are part of the uh, financing solutions. Um, and, uh, and, and if we also consider the current uh, uh, 
uh, discussions on the Eurozone uh, reform. I mean, they, they, they are conducted in an inclusive format, so every, every member state has the possibility to um, uh, participate and, uh, and uh, influence how, how, how the future of the Eurozone is uh, uh, formulated. And then the kind of uh, similar positions uh, the Nordic politics uh, have on the different uh, issues they have been also uh, presented in, in this uh, the Hanseatic League uh, uh, statement. Uh, we sh do share the common uh, principles and then this uh, also uh, makes us uh, uh, natural partners in, in uh, in these uh, Eurozone uh, reform discussions. And uh, maybe uh, uh, one example where this uh, uh, cooperation could, take, um, uh, could be taken to the next level is the spin of the Eurozone, the banking union. Uh, and uh, where both Sweden and Denmark are very seriously considering, uh, uh, or at least studying at the moment, uh, the, the pros and cons of uh, joining also banking union. And, uh, and as it could then become actually the stepping stone for the next step, the actually Eurozone uh, uh, membership. And uh, yeah, probably with the banking union, it is uh, easier uh, for uh, Denmark and uh, Sweden to join, as it is more kind of uh, economic uh, uh, matter. Uh, and uh, in the kind of Eurozone, there are much more kind of political, political uh, issues uh, attached, which may make the kind of uh, uh, barrier to join uh, higher. I will here. Thanks, yes. Anders. May I ask you a very close also to the, to the shaping the positions before the EU Council meetings, so you're actually shaping the positions, the EU Council meetings on the, when there is a Eurozone meeting, are you somehow specially coordinating with non-Eurozone countries also discussing the positions, so probably not like with Denmark and Sweden, for example, or have they interest to, to know more on what's happening in the Eurozone meetings and whether actually quite crucial decisions are, uh, are made. I, why I'm asking that is to, to, to elaborate, is there more room for cooperation, for example, in, in uh, shaping the positions, for example, in the different cases? Uh, yes, of course, <coughs> there, there is interest and, and uh, I mean, uh, we are open to share our, our positions as well. Uh, although there is not any kind of uh, yet uh, structured uh, kind of coordination framework or cooperation. And uh, you could say still that uh, Nordic Baltic 6 plus uh, 2 uh, cooperation, it, it is also still more ad hoc based, uh, not, not too, too structured yet. But uh, when the things get more serious, uh, uh, I guess there is uh, potential for, for, for this uh, coordination. Uh, for more coordination, yes. And maybe second question on EMU reform, uh, that when you look to the key issues like the creating the European Monetary Fund, also what concerns stabilization mechanism, these kind of big issues, that are there any differences between the Nordic Baltic or are they all at the same camp in, uh, in, the, in the big EMU reform issues? Uh, I think uh, we are more or less in the in, in the same camp as uh, uh, we are all uh, kind of really trying to understand for the the need and then what what would uh, for for those new uh, capacities uh, the, the reforms uh, uh, foresee and if if they they are really needed in the in the way they have been proposed and uh, of course what, what uh, kind of joins us is that, that, that it, it, it is the member states itself who should actually bear the first responsibility on, on also on the fiscal side that uh, you should not uh, 
think that there is a, uh, always somebody coming and uh, helping you out when you are not not uh, acting responsibly yourself. So uh, you should be responsible, <coughs> uh, mm, uh, generate buffers, reserves when, when there are the good times, and, uh, and, uh, and then you will be able to react mm -hmm. during the downturns. Thanks, but I think you raised one very, very crucial point on the, that Eurozone it's not only about Euro as a currency, but it's also about other policies and, uh, for example, the banking union. And there may be the impact for a region, or some countries being in, some countries being out, is even, even higher than, than taking, the, <coughs> taking the Euro. That, for example, for banking union, there will be still quite big difference. Uh, for Danish and Swedish banks, are they in or out? And it for sure influences very much also the Baltic region because we have mainly uh, Scandinavian banks uh, here active also. So this is clearly one of the issues which is uh, which is for the future to elaborate and discuss on the how how the how the non-EU Nordic Baltic countries should should move ahead with that. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, uh, I think uh, there, are, there are very much kind of economical I issues behind that. I mean, uh, also uh, Swedish, uh, Danish uh, intentions or at least uh, interest for the banking union, uh, I think it has been even more triggered by the fact that, that there, there might be some of the banking groups who would like to re reallocate their, reallocate their uh, uh, headquarters. So, um, I mean, there are <laughs> very, very, very concrete uh, uh, facts behind that, yes. So now we need to think, is it this issue what divides or unites the, <laughs> the region? Uh, but let's move to Nele <coughs> and to the very, very hot topic nowadays in all the international discussions, which is international trade and uh, trade in general. And uh, we will not talk so much about uh, uh, Juncker and Trump, but we will talk more about um, the trade in the region and in the overall international context. context. Please, Nella. Well, thank you. Um, so, we clearly live in, in volatile times and in a volatile world. The long-established partnerships um, and, in fact, the economic order post-Second World War and the institutional setup are being challenged. The talk of trade wars is in the headlines, uh, concepts such as regulatory alignment and WTO quotas and customs union, previously reserved for the genuine trade policy geeks, are nowadays discussed uh, broadly in public. So I guess it's because of that I have received this kind invitation to the panel, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, I would like indeed to, to say a few words on, on how EU trade policy can help to address the backlash to globalization. And uh, I will set out uh, how we do this through market opening, through the value-based um, trade uh, policy and, and then the enforcement and, and the protection that, that the trade policy of the EU can, can currently offer. Now, uh, Globalization is happening. I mean, there is no way around this. Uh, we have seen that when in the, 20, uh, in the um, early 70s, 20% of the global GDP uh, was trade-based. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's close to 50% of the global GDP, which is hinging on, on, on trade happening. Um, it is also true that the EU is, is very, very integrated in global value chains. Um, so the the market the internal market which has been evoked today is is so vitally important it's important for for your business um, it is important for our external competitiveness as 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 the eu but it it is also f for the sake of trade policy it is a, an essential negotiation chip if you wish because it offers nevertheless we have a 500 million market to 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 offer um, and it's also true that the, the high integration uh, of markets and the shared institutional settings um, contributes very much to the, um, to the, 
the value that, that our companies, uh, the EU companies, can, can generate on these uh, value chains. Um, in fact, the EU ranks highest if you look at, uh, for instance, the, the World um, Investment Report, which is, uh, which is edit, uh, published by UNCTAD, it's the UN uh, Trade Commission. So, um, so when all this is so valuable, how can we um, defend and, and shape uh, the multilateral order, uh, the trading system, so that it serves us also in the future? We do that, obviously we have a very rich uh, bilateral negotiation agenda. Uh, you may have no noticed, and I'm sure you have, uh, is that there was a quite an unprecedented public debate around CETA, the EU-Canada agreement, which today is, is, is provisionally applied, so it is in force. Um, Japan agreement was signed only in July, but it is also um, moving towards um, um, being applied. Um, so these are all important steps. Uh, and there are many, many negotiations uh, that have been concluded, like with Singapore, with Vietnam. And um, there are also, against all these geopolitical shifts and so on, um, globally, there are also important negotiations that the EU has, has, has been engaging in, like with Mexico, Mercosur, uh, and Chile, and Australia and New Zealand. So you can see that the reach is, is, is very broad. And these are, in fact, much more than economic partnerships. In the end, many of these agreements also have formally sort of the association element there too, so they are also political uh, partnerships. In, in, in many cases. So, um, and there is obviously um, much that, that the trade agreements that the EU currently uh, signs and, and applies, it's much more than simply tariff reduction. Uh, there is uh, an agenda that, that also um, projects EU single market to the world, if you wish. Uh, so, we have been engaging on, on, on digital trade, for instance. And then, of course, very, very important uh, things like, um, like uh, um, for instance, in the, in the CETA, in the Canada Agreement that the EU uh, has enforced with Canada, there is a um, sustainable development chapter, which is, which is very, very, um, which is new and which is important. Um, also in the Japan agreement, for instance, there is a, a whole chapter dedicated to SMEs, because in the end, 99% of, of EU companies are small and medium-sized enterprises. So it is also important that you don't only build the roads, so to say, but you also teach people how to drive and how to use the roads. So when 99% of, of, of companies are in fact SMEs, it is very important to create the channel to help the SMEs benefit from these agreements. And not only SMEs, and therefore you may have mentioned that, uh, you ha may have again noticed that obviously Cecilia Malmström and, and this, uh, this um, uh, commission has been, has been doing a lot for enhancing transparency in, in how the EU uh, negotiates trade agreements. Uh, and, uh, and you can find really a lot of material online uh, which, um, which so far was not, was not made public. Um, then, um, finally, I would like to uh, say a few words about, about the side of EU policy, which, um, which has also gained importance uh, at a time where, where, where China is, is, is obviously emerging uh, with unprecedented speed and, and so on, is, is the enforcement side, but, but it's also the protection side. You have heard President Juncker say so many times that the EU is not naive uh, free traders, that you know, when we need, we have the means and tools available um, to protect ourselves. Um, the EU has gone through what we call the steel crisis, meaning that the overcapacities generated in China have led to huge pressures on, on dumped and then subsidized goods and then products coming into the EU, to which the Commission has reacted with a very high number of what we call trade defense measures, so basically to offset the price differences. Um, 
and sort of the second example I would like to bring here is in the previous panel, I believe it was it was mentioned briefly that the concern about security is obviously becoming becoming increasingly uh, increasingly prevalent in the EU, but but it's also the sort of the economic security and and how do we how do we deal with threats to um, to companies or, or, or projects that are in the in the sort of in the public order or in the in the security interest to the EU. So there is a proposal which uh, which is uh, on the path of hopefully being adopted to deal with something called screening of investments. So how do we how do we screen the the foreign direct investment that comes into the EU? Um, finally, on the enforcement side. Um, I mean, indeed, it is one thing to, to negotiate all these agreements. There are over 30 that are in place, in fact. Um, but the other thing is obviously to make sure that the benefits really accrue. So how do we, how do we make that happen? Um, one example is obviously that, that um, the EU has a very um, clear um, agenda to, to bring down barriers to trade all over the world. Um, only last uh, year, 2017, um, 45 obstacles were resolved in 28 countries. And this is, this is basically an activity that the European Commission engages in on behalf of, of companies and governments of the EU to help to convince the third country governments to, to tear down the barriers. Tariff, not so much tariff, but really the non-tariff barriers, the, the bureaucracy, the licenses, that type of uh, that type of, of thing, which can make access to foreign markets really, really tedious. Um, and then, as I started off um, by alluding to the um, to the to the uncertainty and to the challenge that the multilateral uh, institutions and notably the uh, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, are facing. Um, there, as obviously, it is not easy to turn an organization of 164 countries around in a day. It takes time, it takes effort, but the process has started, and I think the the imminence of the challenges is being realised. Uh, the EU is approaching this to try to promote with like-minded partners, the need to first of all to make sure that also globally in WTO there is a dispute settlement system that survives, that there continues to be a way to solve trade disputes, uh, that appellate body, as we, are call, as we call it, or it's called, uh, that the appointments are, are made. Second issue, which uh, obviously is, is very important, is to address the gaps in the rule book because in, uh, I mean, the developments were mentioned, the technological change um, and so on. I mean, we, we, there is a need for, for rules that, that survive 21st century and beyond that are, that are made for purpose. And the third is, is, is improve the day-to-day -day work of that institution. Um, so, so this is also what, what we are really as the EU working on to, to sort of sh uh, pull our weight and also contribute to the, uh, to the not only survival but hopefully um, development uh, of, of the World Trade Organization to keep it relevant and effective. Um, so I think this is, this is what, I would, uh, what, I would, uh, what I would like to, to leave it to. Uh, Bono, you know, the U2 singer, he, he wrote in the F, I'd say, I, um, uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, that Europe is a hard day, a hard sell uh, these days. And, um, and this is despite the fact that, you know, world or Europe hasn't been better um, uh, since 50 years or so. It's, it's, a, it's a good place to live. And, and, and also trade policies is a hard sell. Um, but I think we are very, very determined to, to continue promoting it and making sure that the EU and obviously the, the Nordic Baltic region, which, is, which are champions of, of, of liberal trade and, and trade policy, um, can gain from it. So thank you. Thanks, Nella. You mentioned also the new trade agreements that now the EU is pursuing. And uh, let's be frank, I think the, the Nordic countries have higher interest for these uh, agreements uh, just because there is more 
capacity and more potential for, for trading with these countries. Uh, do you agree with that? And uh, how we would comment the Baltic countries' positions? So are they still all supportive? And how you see this kind of Nordic-Baltic synergies when the negotiating on the new free trade agreements? Uh, thank you. Well, trade policy, as you know, is, is an exclusive competence of the EU. So, so therefore, uh, the Commission negotiates these agreements on behalf of the EU. But obviously, nothing happens without, without the member states having given the Commission a mandate to do so. And then there are always regular contract, uh, contacts during the negotiations. And then, obviously, the signing again is, is and concluding are being um, approved by the Council. So, um, and, and when we talk now about these these big agreements that, that have recently um, been, been signed and approved. Uh, EU trade policy has been, has been very, very consensual. Um, so, so therefore, um, uh, I, would, I would say that, that uh, I think there is a, a, an understanding uh, that, uh, that what trade policy can contribute uh, to Europe. I mean, every additional billion of, of trade uh, generates 14,000 jobs, uh, so, so I think these numbers uh, are known. Um, it is true that, that uh, when it comes to voting on different legislation pertaining to trade, relating to trade, the same trade defence me measures and, 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 and acts and so on, so there obviously you have, you have voting and, and, and member states have, have different alignments. But I would argue that we should rather, of, of course, it, it um, gravitates towards the region where we're in, the, the more the trade liberal approach. But I would say that, that there are lots of lo like-minded partners as well. The second question about the trade. Uh, to try to push a little bit out from the Commission comfort zone also uh, the... Uh, on the issue that, indeed, yeah, trade policy is the common competence of the EU. So basically how the Nordic Party can cooperate is just to coordinate the positions and the specific trade agreements. But there are many other aspects of uh, trade which are not in the Commission competence, for example, on the, what was mentioned here by uh, uh, by Carlis on the marketing and uh, or actually creating the contacts, creating the networks, uh, being in a global value chain in the different, uh, different parts. And uh, I would say that Nordic countries are doing there quite a lot together. There are Nordic embassies and this type of nice things uh, to promote uh, the companies. There have been not so many Nordic Baltic uh, initiatives on Nordic Baltic embassies. So we have seen a couple of joint visits of the Finnish and Estonian uh, politicians, for example, to Asia or the, this type of things. How you would comment on that, on the maybe experience of other countries also, and could hear the region do more because we are still quite small, and in particular in uh, what concerns Asia, Asian markets, Latin American markets, it's clear that. Uh, even Sweden, which is the, the mm. biggest, it's quite small, small country, and mm. uh, not to talk about Estonia or, uh, or Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, well, indeed, I mean, I think you, you answered the question yourself. I mean, export promotion, obviously, is a competence for member states. Uh, and there, uh, the <coughs> more, I think, they can pull together, uh, the better, especially the smaller countries, uh, to, um, to succeed out there. But, um, I would like to say that I think, because, because I also work very closely on the Eastern Partnership region, and there, when we talk about initiatives in the region, it is, it is true that I think there, in these countries, if we take Ukraine, Georgia, uh, for instance, you can see that both the Baltic states are there with their projects, but, but also the, uh, the Scandinavian or the Nordic. So I think the, the care or the the interest in, in, in the eastern neighbourhood succeeding, I think, is, is an issue that, that brings the region together also as, it, uh, as concerns trade and, and more broadly the, the investment environment in these countries. Good. Before we go for questions from the audience, I would like to throw out 
one additional horizontal question, uh, which is always now asked in all the discussions, of course, is the impact of Brexit. And uh, from the economic point of view, um, clearly, the leaving uh, of the UK from the EU has quite big impact to the, to the whole Nordic Baltic region. And I think there are two dimensions. One is more on the EU decision making side. And another one is that is there any other this kind of economic impact or any other impacts which is worth to mention in relation to uh, the relation to Brexit? Who wants to start? Among us, please. <coughs> Thank you. As I said, one I think quite clear effect of Brexit is uh, fragmentation of the single market and weakening uh, of uh, political support uh, within EU member states. 